Let's get into our study, Malachi chapter 3. We're going to be looking at this subject. It's really a question. Is it vain to serve God? Worthless, vain. Is it futile to serve God? So beginning at verse 13, reading to verse 18, Malachi chapter 3. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. Yes, those who tempt God go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. As we've been going through the book of Malachi, we've seen that this book contains an account of the people who are arguing with God. Here, Malachi exposes their hearts by referring to their attitude that is revealed by the way that they argue. And I want to say it that way. Their attitude is revealed by the way that they argue. And God addresses that because he says in verse 13, your words have been harsh against me. Now, the word harsh in the original language speaks of words that are arrogant. Um, we're, they're using offensive language against him. Their hearts are hardened. And so he's speaking about their attitude. Your arrogant attitude has angered me, is what he is saying here. And so I want to develop my introduction with you tonight by making it very clear that it isn't that God does not have the patience to endure their questions. There are more than a few places in Scripture that contain people actually asking questions of the Lord. It's an unhealthy attitude if we come to the point of thinking that God is not capable of answering our questions. It's not that God has a problem with them asking questions, because we see, again, questions very often being posed to the Lord in Scripture. In Job 13, 24, the question is asked, Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? Psalm 10, verse 1, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Lamentations 5.20, why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Jeremiah 12.1, Lord, you always give me justice when I bring a case before you. Now let me bring you this complaint. Why are the wicked so prosperous? Why are evil people so happy? And so you, you go in your scriptures and you read them and you find over and over again throughout the Bible that there are questions posed of the Lord. They ask God questions. So it's not that God is unable to understand us. It's not that God is far from us and doesn't recognize that we are human beings with, with weaknesses and all. I mean, the psalmist in Psalm 103, verse 14, says it like this. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And so it's not that God... Is, is challenged or intimidated by questions. It's not that he thinks that we'll never have any questions. You know, in my walk with the Lord over the years, when I was, especially as a new believer, going through my times uh, of struggle, I thought that I was actually almost blasphemous in in having questions, in, in, in needing answers. And I discovered long ago that God isn't intimidated by my questions, and he knows that I am simply dust, animated dust. He knows that. 
He knows my weaknesses. He knows my frame. He knows my propensity to think that he may be against me because things aren't happening the way that I would like them to happen at this moment. So therefore, God must be mad at me. You know, Job was an individual. I mentioned him a moment ago. Job is an individual who uh, had questions. And, and uh, it's interesting when you read the book of Job, how God actually dealt with Job, because when you read the book of Job, you see that from the third chapter of the book of Job all the way to the 37th chapter, God allows questions to be posed. So you have the third chapter all the way to the 37th, and there's a series of questions throughout the book of Job that are being asked, and God allows that. And he allows those questions to be posed before he answers. But it's interesting how the Lord responds, because when you look in Job chapter 38, for example, verses 1 through 3, uh, it reads, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, and this is how he answered, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Then he goes on to say, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. How would you like that if the Lord did that to you? Who do you think you are, you little worm? <laughs> who are you who are asking questions like you've got all the knowledge of the universe? Who are you to approach me with that attitude? And so it's not that the Lord was threatened by the questions of Job. He, he's going to show him some things in just a moment, but he does remember our attitudes as we speak to him. Now, after the Lord begins his series of questions, it's interesting how Job responds to God's questions. You see that in Job 42, where it says in verses 1 through 6, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear. Now, what is interesting about that to me is when you begin the book of Job in chapters 1 and 2, and God makes a declaration concerning Job, he says he's a righteous man. But Job says, what I have believed has been taught to me, but now I have personal experience with you. There are levels of knowledge that you can have. There's the intellectual possession of knowledge. You you have knowledge in the sense that you've studied about certain things and thus you're able to speak about them. So there's the intellectual possession of knowledge and there's the experiential understanding. And what's good in Christianity and what God would have for us is to not simply have the intellectual content, but also the experience. And the knowledge that God would have us to have is not simply the accumulation of information, filling up notebooks or notes on the side of my, my Bible, but filling up my heart with practical understanding. And so Job was simply saying, what I had received, I've obeyed, but now I have a practical experience with the God of the universe, and that has caused me to abhor myself in dust and ashes, to put my hand over my mouth and realize I have no right to question you. I have no right to. He came to that understanding. Again, it's not that the Lord doesn't allow for our lack of understanding. It's just that his ways are not our ways, and his understanding is higher than ours ever can be on the face of the earth. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says it like this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So his anger is directed towards the dishonor and disrespectful arrogance that they're showing him. We need to remember that he's the king of the entire universe, 
and he is to be feared. He's to be reverenced. And so the point that we have here in the introduction is, what gives these sinners the right to question him? In, in Romans chapter 9, verse 20, uh, Paul said, Indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? And so the Lord is speaking to this attitude that they have. You see, the priests, as we've been going through Malachi, we've noted this, have not honored the Lord. And they've been influencing the people to be the same way. And that's what normally happens. A student will become like the teacher. So the priest was to be an example, yet the people, though the priest was not a good example, the, the people were equally guilty because they weren't being faithful to the truth. You see, the fruit of the ministry is that, that people are saying that it's useless to worship God. And they've learned to doubt the goodness and kindness of God through the faithless priests. He says in verse 14, you have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So that's the fruit of their ministry. Now, they're saying we have mourned over our sin. We've tried to obey, and it's proven to be useless. What's the point? Why try any further? God doesn't care. He doesn't even notice how hard we're trying. Now, up to this point, as we've been going through Malachi, we've noticed that they've made many, many comments concerning the Lord. They have said, God doesn't love us. They've said he isn't worthy of our sacrifices. They've said he's unjust. He doesn't deserve a full tithe. And now he is unreasonable to call us to repentance. And, and notice their self-assessment when they say, we have, kept, we have kept his ordinance and we have walked as mourners. So for them, serving the Lord doesn't make sense. It's a waste of time because it doesn't pay off. And listen, if we observe his law, we're still no better off if we didn't. So what's the point? They're saying, you have said, the one who worships before the Lord gains nothing. Uh, what riches do we gain because we have kept his word, because we have walked in humility before the Lord of hosts? So this is what they're saying. So what do we gain? In what way does it pay off? Just what benefit do we derive from serving God? Now, we'll look at this closely here. That's a common way that people look at righteous expression, religious expression rather, and that is, what do I get out of it? What do I get out of it? We could, we could speak about this off the top of my head for a long time. I have to be careful that I don't. But I believe that in these last days, that's becoming more and more evident. How does a person select a place that they go and worship and serve the Lord? How do they select that place? Is it, is it, you know, and this is, this is not a knock, this is an observation. This isn't a judgment on people's hearts. If it sounds that way, forgive me, that's not my intent. What I'm trying to say is this is what I have observed, and, and I believe this to be true as I develop this. It's vain to serve the Lord. What do we get out of it? Um, sometimes we can select a place because we feel good when we're there. You know, I, I, I like the personality of the of the of the minister, I enjoy the music. Um, doesn't require an awful lot out of me to be there. I don't have to do anything, I just show up. Um, I can sometimes hide in the crowd and I'm invisible and I want to be that way. Not many demands in any way, shape or form made. And, and what we do is we end up um, really with this attitude, what do I gain? And what we're gaining from that experience is is not spiritual so much as just experiential, just pleasurable, or just something that I enjoy at this moment. What am I gonna get out of going there? What am I gonna get out of being there? Um, I, I pray that the Lord will help us, each one of us in this room, and who may hear this message someday. I, I do pray that the Lord helps us to say, you know, the reason I go to where I go is because when I walk out, I want to I want to serve and love Jesus more, and I've learned something about Him that helps me to not just survive, but to be a helper to somebody else and to thrive in the circumstances I find myself in. 
The Bible, when we go through the word of God, is intended to equip us for works of service. It's intended to build us up in our faith. It's intended to reveal who God is to us and to help us to worship him in spirit and truth. And so if I go to church just with the attitude of what can I gain in a profit, profitable way, what am I going to add to myself in a personal way that isn't spiritual, then what I'm doing is I'm actually acting in the flesh. And I'm looking for something to entertain me and not to edify me. And it's not hard to get into that place where you select the place that you go to, not on the things that are making you better in your walk with God, but the profit that you feel you're gaining from being there. So this is a common way that people look at religious expression. What do I get out of it? What do I get out of serving God? In Job 21, verses 14 and 15, Job said concerning the wicked, they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Then they go on to say, who is the Almighty that we should serve him and what profit do we have if we pray to him? So they believe the best religion brings the greatest advantage in the things of this life. And so for them, worship is about them and how they feel. Jude 19, in the New Testament book of Jude, verse 19, Jude 19 reads, These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And so as this is taking place and they're asking that question, he says in, in verse 15, so now we call the proud blessed and those who do wickedness are raised up. Yes, those who tempt God go free. So in spite of all we've tried to do for him, still the proud and the wicked are blessed and we suffer so it just doesn't pay to follow God. Now, sometimes it seems as if the genuinely righteous people get the short end of the stick, doesn't it? It does, you don't have to answer. <laughs> Often genuinely committed believers seem to have very difficult times in their lives. In Psalm 73 verses two and three, it reads, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Psalm 73, 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. He says, my feet had almost slipped. I see the prosperity of the wicked. They're always increasing. There used to be a show a long time ago, I think it was called something like The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And they still have shows like that to this day that I guess are intended to make ordinary people envious and covet. You know, and they show these, these jets and they show these mansions and, <laughs> and they show these luxurious cars and, and then you go and look at yours <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Marie and I, my wife and I used to go to uh, model homes when they're opening them up just to look at them. Then I'd come home and I'd say, I live in a dump. I live in a dump. This is a dump. <laughs> and that's not hard to do, is it? I mean, and sometimes you'll see this and you'll say, this, is, this seems unfair. It, it seems as if the righteous don't, don't always get treated right. And I'm sure we've all felt that way in one way or another. Why do others prosper and it doesn't seem that I do? You may be making an, honor, uh, an effort to honor the Lord, but you wonder, as much as I want to serve the Lord, why does it seem that evil is winning? These, these people, I look around and these people don't fear the Lord. They very seldom ever mention him and yet their lives seem to be pleasurable and they seem to have everything that they want. All you gotta do is look around you, and I know we all do that in one form or another. We observe you know, um, the world we live in, and so you're out there working with your hands as hard as you can, doing the best that you can, and then you read the newspaper about a baseball player who makes $32.8 million a year to play, to play baseball. 
Or, or you read about a football player. There's a Chicago Bear quarterback who ha he has a contracted price of $126,700,000 over seven years to throw a football. LeBron, LeBron James makes $64.8 million a year to play basketball. Floyd Mayweather, boxer, $300 million in a year. Actor Tom Cruise, $75 million. Jay-Z, that great intellectual philosopher, <laughs> his net worth is $500 million. Beyonce's is $450 million. Paul McCartney, some of you may remember that old man. His net worth is $1.2 billion. And you say, you know, outside of entertainment value, and again, I'm not knocking this, I'm simply, you know, pointing something out, you know, use your gifts and, and, and do well, and there's nothing wrong with having success, so I hope it doesn't come off that way. But these are people that are enormously, enormously wealthy, but I don't see anybody marching against them, calling them one percenters, which I find is interesting. So as long as they entertain us, I guess it's okay. So I don't think making a good amount of money is evil in and of itself. And it's not necessarily wrong. I, I'm in favor of free enterprise. But sometimes you can think, but why them? Why them? Why do things go so well with them and things don't seem to go well with us? You raise your kids the best that you can and they don't want to follow the Lord with all their hearts. You do the best that you can on your job. You're honest, you're there on time, you work a full eight hours, but you get passed up for promotions all the time. You do the best job that you can at home. As a wife, you're doing the best you can to raise the kids and care for the home, but your husband doesn't appreciate it. You try to follow the Lord as a man, but your wife says, I don't like the way you've become, you're boring, and I don't want to be with you anymore. I've, I've seen that. And it just, in the back of your mind, you say, this doesn't seem fair. Why do the wicked prosper? Why, why do they seem to always be at ease? Why, why does that evil coworker that I have who's so profane and doesn't work a full 40, and yet he comes back with pictures of him in, in Maui, and, and for me, you know, going to Seal Beach is an excursion. We make our own sandwiches. Why? It seems sometimes that those who tempt God go free from any bad happening now or ever. It seems that way. Again, looking at poor Job, Job in chapter 21 verses 7 through 13 asks, uh, why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not upon them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows calve do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. Their little ones dance about. They sing to the music of tambourine and harp. They make merry to the sound of the flute. They spend their years in prosperity, go down to the grave in peace. So Job had that question, but he says in, in chapter 21, verse 18, they're like straw before the wind, like chaff that a storm carries away. King David said in Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, do good. Dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. And he went on to say in verses 9 and 10, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. What seems to be what's going to last forever, very often is God simply giving them a space to repent. And instead of us envying them, we need to think of their end. What, ends, what they end up with because of the rejection of God. That means that as believers, we actually cultivate what has been called an eternal perspective. And we hold on to the Lord through all the seasons of our life, knowing that God is in control and he honors the love that we have for him as well as our obedience. In, in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, the prophet writes, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Even if it doesn't seem to be going well, yet I will trust him. That's the key. The key. So in the case of Israel, people are complaining against God. Self-righteously, they're protesting that they're doing the right things, and yet they're not profiting. Again, in verse 14, they had said, we've kept his ordinances, walked as mourners to no profit. They, they thought outward appearance was enough. They walked in sackcloth and ashes, pretending to be grieved when in reality they were pretending to sorrow over their sin. This is something that when you read your Bible that you'll notice, this is something that they, the nation had done earlier in their history. In the book of Isaiah, in, in Isaiah, uh, he, he, the question is asked, why have we fasted, they say, and, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. So why does it seem that it's vain to serve the Lord? And so God is dealing with that. Again, he said, you have said in verse 14, it's vain to serve God. What profit is it? Now we call the proud blessed. Those who do wickedness are raised up. Those who tempt God go free. It seems as if they get away with it and uh, they go free. There's nothing that's done. But the fact is, no, that's only what you see at this moment. You're not going to tempt God and go free because ultimately the Lord is going to deal with you. But it goes on to say in verse 16, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him and those, for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And so... Verse 16, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. The Lord listened and heard them. So in the midst of this ungodly nation, a remnant of sincere believers are meeting. Notice how these people are described. It's, they are described as those who feared the Lord. These are those who hold God in awe and reverence. In Psalm Rather, Proverbs 3, 7, and 8. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, for it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord has um, certain evidences and blessings that go along with them. If there's anything that is lacking 
in the church today, I would say it's the fear of the Lord. For the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. And there are, are many professing Christians who haven't departed from evil, who actually continue to practice it and feel that it's okay and acceptable to God. But that's not true. When a person continues to practice that which God forbids, it's only demonstrating they have no reverence for him and they have no respect for his word. They don't, they don't believe what God is saying. It's, it's the attitude that Israel has where we can do evil and God will still bless us. And yet there are a group of people that are meeting that we're looking at in verse 16, those who fear the Lord, and they're speaking to one another. One another. So that tells me, and it tells us, those who feared the Lord were speaking to one another, tells us that they were encouraging each other to do the right thing. Listen, as a believer, make the practice, make it your practice to be an encourager to other people to do the right thing. Make that your practice, that you're going to be someone who exhorts and encourages other people as you are desiring to serve the Lord too, to do the right kind of thing. One of the might as well go here and share a story with you. Story time. I don't know how to put this because I don't want it to take too long. I, wasn't, I didn't prepare this story, so I'll just kind of share it quickly. Um, coming out of the background I came out of, you know, from the craziness of a kid and the stuff I did, when I got saved, I started thinking that from when I first got saved that God's word was true and I ought to obey it. That doesn't mean I did. That doesn't mean that I, I've ever been 100% faithful to God. And I certainly don't want to give the impression that even at this point in my walk that I am, because I'm not, I'm, I'm still moving in the direction God would have me. I'm still growing up. And I say that openly and honestly as a fact. But I always had one thing, and that was, I, I, I want to do the right thing. I, I want to do the right thing. I want to be a person who fears the Lord. I want to be a person who's blessed by God. And that, that started when I was first saved. But I, I had friends that I was around after I got out of the army and I was going to a, to a, a particular church uh, in my area. It wasn't a Calvary ministry, but I went there on, on Thursdays, Thursday nights and Sunday nights and I made friends there, I started encountering people who had been raised as Christians who didn't have that, that, that attitude. It was kind of like, this is what we've always been. This is, this is how Christians are. And me, I had the zeal of a newborn believer. I just, just was saved, man. I came out of the alcohol. I came out of the drugs. I came out of the, the lying and the stealing and, and all of that garbage that goes along with that lifestyle. I came out of that. I've been washed. I'm clean. I'm free. And, and I want to be around people who, who are examples to me to help me to learn how to be a, a, a man, to learn how to be a man of God. And so naturally, I would, I would want to be with guys and and, and be around young women who were serious about their walks with God, because that's how I'm going to grow, is to be around people who, who encourage me in that, because I know how easy it is to backslide, how easy it is to just, you know, to get depressed or bummed out about something and, and just go right back to what you used to do. I know that because when I started to walk with the Lord, I'd be walking real well, and then, then I'd stumble, and then I'd find myself wanting to go back or going back. Then I'd have to dust myself off, confess, and forsake, and, and, and repent, and, oh, God, help me, and then move on again. And that was a pattern. And so I, I learned within the first three or four years of my walk with Christ, I need people around me that can be examples, who can show me how to successfully navigate this life as a Christian. I need that. I do. I need that because the world isn't going to show me how to follow God. It's not going to show me how to abstain from evil. It's not going to teach me how to not want that drink or to smoke that, that joint or to sleep with that girl. It, it isn't going to teach me not to do that. It's going to encourage me to do that by saying it's all right. 
And I knew enough as an early believer that I needed help. And so I was around people who were raised Christian. And it wasn't at a Calvary ministry because I was going to a different ministry at that time. And my walk with the Lord very slowly began to, to go down rather than to climb. And I couldn't put my, my finger on it. I didn't know what's wrong. Why am I walking away from what I felt was the most important thing that I've ever done, which is come to faith in Christ? Why am I not as on fire now as I used to be? There are a lot of reasons, but one of them was the people I was around, whom I, I loved very much, were not on fire for Christ themselves. And I didn't realize that until one day I was going with some friends who invited me to go to a movie, see a movie. This is back in 1973. Yeah, they had movies then, 1973. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a young woman seated next to me as we're driving to the movies. And I turned to her and I started, I asked her, are you Christian? You know, it's a conversation, are you Christian? No, well, why not? That's a, that was a reasonable question, I thought. Why not? Why aren't you a Christian? I'm interested. So she started sharing with me why she's not a Christian. I said, really? Now, I'm a new Christian. I just got out of the army. I'm not well-versed in scripture, but I, I want to talk to her, and I do. And I tell her, you need the Lord. You need Jesus, man. Jesus will change your life. He'll, 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 he'll fill you to the top. One of my friends later on takes me aside and says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have, you were pressuring her. You shouldn't pressure her. And I thought, is that what I'm doing? I'm pressuring people? Is there something wrong with me? I honest to goodness thought something, there must be something wrong with me because I want them saved and my friends don't. And my friends have been Christians all their lives. Something's wrong here. Okay, here you go, second part of the same story. <laughs> all of you have heard me talk about Luke 7, 36 through 50, many times if you're in my church. The woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears. Where did that come from? And why is she so precious to me that I repeat this one portion of scripture like it's the only one I know, right? Because there are people saying, you know, can't you tell me a different scripture? Come on, blah, blah. you do it too much. Because she, her story changed my life. That's why. Because I was reading as a new believer, I got there. And Jesus said, paraphrase, the one who's been forgiven much loves much. And I said, bam. I love you, Lord. For forgiving me so much. And listen, it's easy to forget how much he forgave you. And you just start doing the thing. And then here's the second part of that. You begin to influence other people you shouldn't push your faith on other people. You shouldn't say, why? Because you're not on fire anymore. You just don't know it. You have, you have gotten away from where you first came in to the degree that you don't understand people who are not even as bad as you were before you got saved. And now we condemn, and now we judge, and now we say things about people. I don't understand how they, oh, you've forgotten where you came from. Or maybe you don't remember, or maybe you never saw yourself as bad as God knew you to be. But when you finally 
have the mirror of the word of God and you see yourself for what you really are, what you really are in the light of his countenance, in, in, in comparison to his holiness, God forgive me a sinner. God be merciful to me a sinner because that's what I am. And without you, I can do nothing. When you understand that and you build your life on that, your life changes. Then you become an influence to other people. For all of you to love God and you hold each other up when you're falling. We were in military, we were running. And in the army, you run everywhere. And none of us are marathoners. None of us are tremendous athletes. We're all getting fatigued and we're running everywhere we go. And it's the end of the day and we're running towards our barracks and we're going up a hill. And there's a guy next to me, actually, yeah, next to me, his name was Larry. And Bill and I, my friend Bill and I are running next to Larry. And Larry starts slowing down because he can't make it up the hill. And I'm no great athlete. And I also know that if Larry falls out, we've got to all come around and pick him up and go back up the hill a second time. I ain't going to do that. So I, without thinking, put my arm underneath his arm. And Bill gets on the other side. And we lift him up. We don't carry him, but we lift him up. And we, we run with him in our arms up the hill till we get to the top of the hill, let him go, and then he just is able to coast down and we finish the run. How do I remember that? He wrote me about two months ago. Larry did. I led him, Bill and I led him to faith in Christ in 1971. And he said, I was writing, he says, I was preparing a Bible study, Dave, and I thought of you. And the Bible speaks concerning carrying one another. And I remember when you and Bill carried me as I was running with you. And that became an example to me of what people should do for one another. We carry each other through our struggles. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's what I'm supposed to do. Because we're in the race together. And sometimes we want to drop out. But you got a brother or a sister next to you who will put their arm around you and say, I'll run with you step by step. We're going to make it together. That's the community of believers. We don't leave anyone behind. We carry them with us. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's when it says, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. So thank God for friends who love us enough to share with us and encourage us. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They were encouraging one another to walk solidly with the Lord. And notice verse 16, the Lord listened and heard them. The word heard means paid attention to them. The psalmist says it like this, Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. And he says their faithful works were noted by the Lord. They, they were noted in what is called his book of remembrance. Now, when he speaks concerning a book of remembrance that was written before him, this book of remembrance is a way of stating that God does not forget. God does not forget their good works. God does not forget anything. He doesn't need to jot down notes in case he forget. But God bears in his own eternal mind a remembrance of the person's thoughts, words, and actions, the actions of his people. Like it says again in Hebrews 6, verse 10, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God remembers what you've done. He says in verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts on that day that I make them my jewels. When he speaks of the, making them my jewels, my special treasure, this is another way of saying that they have great value 
To him, Deuteronomy 7 tells us in verse 6, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And as his children, he will, he will spare them on the day of his judgment when he comes again. The psalmist said in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities, as the heavens are high above the earth. So great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we're dust. He says in verse 18, then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and, and one who does not serve him. It will be evident who truly served the Lord, who served him with sincerity and true faith. Someone said, this is the one who served him both privately and publicly in righteousness and true holiness, in spirit and in truth, with faith and fervency, with reverence and fear heartily and willingly seeking his glory without any dependence on their services. These are the ones who are, are righteous. The others are ungodly. They're the ones who only outwardly serve the Lord, but they have a selfish heart in it. They do it according to their own invention, according to traditions of men, and they don't do it according to the will of God. You see, in the day of God's judgment, the genuine believer will be easily distinguishable from the hypocrite. Today, it's, it's, sometimes it can be difficult to know who is genuine and who's not because it's, it's easy for us to, to pretend faith. It's not hard. It's not hard to to find a Bible, to quote a scripture, to have an appearance of, of faith. We're in a political season, and a lot of politicians will dust off their Bibles, and sometimes the dust is so thick they almost choke <laughs> when they dust it off. It's not hard to pretend to be righteous. And some, well, and sometimes you don't know the difference because that person can come off in such a righteous form that sometimes you feel convicted because they seem so much better than you. And in reality, they don't know the Lord at all. They're just, well, the, the Greek word was hypocrite. They're just great actors. They, they put on so well. Again, we don't run around trying to make judgments on somebody's true faith in Christ or not. That's not up to us to determine. But there are times that there are those who, they're very good at, at blending in, very good at appearing righteous. In 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, the sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them, but sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those who are not cannot be hidden. You know, some sins are obvious. Some people, <laughs> that guy's drunk, he's got his bottle, and that's, that's real obvious. That guy is all drunk. Yeah, that's a sin. That's an obvious sin. But some guys, some guys can be in church, and just as drunk as that guy on the street corner, you just don't know they are. Listen, on, on Sundays after church, it's happened more than once. When the trash is being dumped, they have found, you know, half pints empty that somebody was downing before they came into church. They're out there drinking. I guess that's what it takes to listen to me for 40 minutes. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, but they, they bring their bottle in. They drink it and they drop it in the trash. Now, but you don't know. What are you going to do? Walk up and stand real close and <laughs> try and smell their breath? 
You might be sorry. <laughs> right? Some sins are obvious, and some follow behind. Pharisees, during the time of Christ, were model religious people. When Jesus said, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the, of the scribes and the Pharisees, those who heard him said, then who can be saved? Because they were so scrupulous in their religion that they even, even tithed of their, their mints, you know, their herb, their, their cumin, they, the, you know, the herbs they would tithe. You know, they, they prayed on street corners. They, they gave sums of money. They wore their, their phylacteries, uh, little boxes with prayers in them on their foreheads and on their, on their wrists. And, and people knew that these were Pharisees. These, these were the righteous people on the, on the, in the planet. And these, these were people who could quote the masters and, and, and the rabbis of, of ages ago. And, and they were the people that, that you would model yourself after. And Jesus said, you're whitewashed too. Beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of decay and dead men's bones. Think about that for a minute. So when you're looking at these people, you would have said, I can never measure up to their religiosity. I could never be as righteous as that. Some men sins follow after them. They're not obvious. We, we can't distinguish that. We simply have to trust that the Lord can. But he says in verse 18, you shall again discern between the righteous and wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does, does not serve him. In that day, there won't be any confusion as to who belongs to him and who doesn't. In that day when the Lord reveals all of this, it'll be very obvious. And I'll close with one last uh, observation, and that is, we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares and how that the tear is called darnel. The tear, when it first buds and begins to grow, looks identical to wheat. It looks identical. And you don't know whether it's darnel or actual wheat until it's fully mature. And then it becomes evident because it doesn't bear fruit. The church today, in general, throughout this nation, is filled with tares, filled with tares. Who look like the real thing. And I, again, forgive me if it sounds like I'm judging, I'm not. I'm speaking the truth. It's a fact. There are many who claim to love Jesus, but their lives, though on the outward, may appear to be okay. Their sins that are unrepented of are what dominate their lives. They never read the Word because they don't care about it. They never pray unless they need something. They go to church when it's convenient. Some go to church just to pray on the women or pray on the men. They go to pray, but not pray. <laughs> God help us in these last days. We, 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 need, we need in this nation an awakening. We need to wake up. We're, uh, the church is asleep. We're allowing evil to not only fester but take over. And we're just silently saying, I can't judge people. You're not judging people, but you most certainly are judging the fruit. I haven't been called to judge people, but I am a fruit inspector. And if there isn't any of the fruit of the Spirit there, if there's no fruit of righteousness there, if there's no hunger for the things of God there, if there's no desire for righteousness, if there's not a desire to walk in holiness, if there's not a hatred for sin and a, and a growing embracing of who Christ is and a, and a desire to love him more daily, there's something wrong with my walk. 
there's something wrong. I, I might not even have one. I may have convinced myself that I'm a Christian because I raised my hand or I went forward at an invitation, but my life never changed. It's the same. My dad told me this, and I'll close with this. My dad said, David, he said, what caused me to come to faith in Christ was the change in your life. He said, I knew you needed God, and I saw what God did in you. And that awakened me to the claims of Christ. He said, your sister, Madeline, she is the best girl I've ever known. He said, I knew that I was never as good as her, but I was a lot better than you. <laughs> he said, so when I knew you came to faith in Christ, I said, well, of course, he needs God. But when I saw your sister, who was so good, come to faith in Christ, I said to myself, if that good little girl needs Jesus, how much more do I? Listen, the quality of your life speaks volumes, volumes to people. Because what you are speaks so loudly, they can't hear a word you're saying sometimes. That's why it's been said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Because that's what I like. Listen, we were bought at a price. Therefore, we glorify God with our body and our spirit, which belong to him. God is our master. He owns us. That's why Jesus would ask the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? If you love me, keep my commandments. That's Christianity. Anything less than that is a sham. Anything less than that isn't real. People say, oh, you Christians, you're under grace. You don't have commandments. Did you know there are more commands in the New Testament than you have in the Old? Did you know that? Because that's the word of how a believer is to live in this world. And what we have today is a shabby understanding of grace that gives me permission to live in sin and think I'm going to heaven. It's a great deception that is on the church today. We need to repent. We need to say, God, be merciful to us, because to be honest with you, I haven't taken you seriously. Because there's a day coming when you will make the difference so obvious, so obvious, those who belong to you and those who don't. I don't want to be tear. I want to be wheat. So God, work in my life that the wheat may be real.